Yeah, so the word is up to you. Please tell us about Sherry. All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. So what I think we'll talk about over the course of the next hour um, is why might we want a revised computing architecture and why what is Cherry and why it might be what we want. Um, we'll do a little bit of discussion about Cherry and Cherryfied software, like looking underneath um, the, the compiler. Uh, and then I will tell you about my, my particular research thrust, which is on heap temporal safety on top of the Cherry architecture. Um, Interrupts are not deferred during this. Please just ask questions as they arise. Um, and of course, I owe immense credit to my coworkers at MSR and the university from whom I have stolen liberally to make these slides. So if we look out in the, you know, across computing right now, we've basically settled on VAX uh, as the pervasive architecture. So everything is just a von Neumann register machine with integer indexed memories attached to them. Yeah, there's some caches in there, but they're not really architecturally visible. We do time slice execution with a memory management unit that provides coarse grain isolation and sharing between these emulated computers. Uh, and there's a notion of privileged rings and some transition mechanisms between those rings the control over the MMU is limited to the, the higher rings. So we, uh, on top of that, this architecture, we build a process with threads abstraction mediated by a kernel of some form, processes access system resources through system control or system calls, which is to say they take ring exceptions and go into the kernel, do something, come back down. Um, and threads within a process tend to share resources. Any thread can do anything that the process can do. Um, they're really just there to take advantage of more CPU cores or to, to block uh, in the scheduler. Most of the interesting protection in this story is at the process granularity. And unfortunately, processes are expensive. So if you take an application and turn it into multiple processes, you have to manage IPC serialization and synchronization. There's overt context switching costs between these things. There's increased TLB pressure and a bunch of things that get harder and harder to measure. But more importantly, perhaps, there's also developer friction. Our languages didn't really grow up in a, uh, a multi-process setting. So IPC is often extra work. So this means it's entirely left to the programmer. Um, and as a result, programs are partitioned into multiple processes, which is to say multiple protection domains, really only under duress. Everything might still be OK, right, despite that. But there are hundreds of CVEs just coming out of Microsoft every year, right? And this is you know, one company, admittedly a big one, but just one company is having more than one critical vulnerability every day, year after year. And 70% of those are memory safety problems, which is to say that they're not logic bugs. They're not sort of mistakes that you might imagine a human would make. They are mistakes in expressing what we want to do to this architecture. So maybe even though the architecture is settled, it's not safe for human use. So why is that? Well, if we drill in a little bit, there are two there are two real reasons for that. The first is that vulnerabilities are easy to create in this architecture. So if we think about a classical buffer overflow attack, right, the kinds of problems that we've been thinking about since the 80s, we will we have our thread doing something, it has a register file, it allocates a region of virtual memory, dedicates it to be a string buffer, constructs pointers into that that buffer. But of course, next to that buffer will be something important to the machine, you, like a return address or a function pointer, because they just get thrown into memory together. So when a, if we have a buggy copy loop or a miss, you know, a, uh, an overlong mem movie or, or whatever, um, if buggy code overruns a buffer, frequently the overrun will hit control data about the machine, and will then subject that data to attacker control. Eventually, for example, the return address will end up being put back into a register and will eventually end up in the program counter, at which point the attacker has taken control of the machine. There's 
no architectural facility to stop many things that we probably didn't want to happen in this story. So the attacker was able to write outside the target buffer because it's just an adjacent memory word. What's the problem? They were able to corrupt or inject code pointers because pointers are just data. They're just numbers. And they were able to execute data as code or reuse code because there's nothing to say that you can't execute bytes or that you can't conjure up a return address and jump somewhere. There's a Historically, there have been a pile of workarounds that keep not solving the problem. So these are things like address space layout randomization or DEP NX uh, stack canaries, right? All of these things get proposed, implemented at great expense, and then defeated, leaving us with just slightly weirder weird machines that are still subject to adversarial control. The other problem, having, having exploited a vulnerability, it's generally catastrophic. So software is always, almost universally soft on the inside. There's no real compartmentalization to it. Once you have taken over any thread from anywhere in the program, you can do anything that that program can do. You don't even need to have like end up in the right place in the program so that you have pointers to the resources that you want because you just make them up. You just inject them and feed them back over the network. So what does Cherry do about all of this? Well, from a very high level, the thing that we would like is that vulnerabilities should be harder to introduce. If they're introduced, it should be harder to exploit them. If they're exploited, it should be, uh, they should be limited in their impact. And yet, we have all of this existing software. So some people propose things like, oh, you know, just rewrite everything in a memory safe language. And indeed, that does work, but it would be a huge investment. So Cherry is attempting to, uh, to you know, split the difference and allow existing software to become more secure. So Cherry is a, an architectural extension that is designed, and I'll say more about what exactly that means, um, designed in service of these goals. So it gives us a way all the way down at the architecture you know, in the silicon to have some notion of object bounds um, even in the face of arbitrary instruction sequences. Uh, we can limit the set of objects, whatever objects might have meant to your program in source form. We can limit the set of objects accessible, again, even to arbitrary code. And it is designed to be broadly compatible with existing C and C++ software um, and has a sandboxing mechanism for things that we can't recompile. Uh, before we get into it, just where is it now? Um, it's a decade plus research project uh, from SRI and the University of Cambridge. Um, the ISAs are formally specified with key properties uh, having machine check proofs. Um, originally was based on MIPS, but is now much more focused on RISC-V. Uh, there are a bunch of different FPGA cores of various flavors uh, and a QEMU implementation. We use LLVM and Clang um, at, for most of our compilation work. We have a fork of FreeBSD that runs on this called CherryBSD. It runs completely uh, pure capability. There's, it's not taking advantage of any of the, the um, uh, compatibility mechanisms. Uh, there's also a, a free RTOS fork. We have GDB, and we have some quite substantial applications ported, including Postgres, Qt WebKit, rsync, Python is in progress, for example. And then the newest excitement is ARM's Morello research prototype, uh, which is a experimental cherry realization on top of ARM V8A. Uh, it's the centerpiece of the UKRI ISCF DSVD program. Um, it's a, it really is an experiment. It's a superset architecture. They kind of threw in everything, including the kitchen sink to see what works. Um, but it's a multi gigahertz, uh, that we will have a multi gigahertz silicon implementation expected later this year, assuming it doesn't slip, here's hoping. Um, if you want to play with this, there's a simulator, the compilers, Cherry BSD, and applications are available now. Um, GCC, Linux, and Android are on the way. Okay, so any questions on any of that? Okay, so. Cherry. Sorry, I, 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 sorry, sorry, this yeah. slide on me there. So, um, is there a 
was there a, a kind of detailed kind of cost? I, I mean, the answer could be no, and that's fine. But was there a kind of cost analysis done of like what would it? What's the cost to sort of rewriting everything in memory safe languages? But and just like saying, you know, nuts to the past, it was all wrong. You know, let's just start doing things right. Versus, okay, let's address the legacy and do it this other way. You know, like. I'm interested in those kind of questions, like how, how does one decide to do that? Um, yes, I'm not aware of anyone having like rigorously sat down and tabulated, but but even like back of the envelope calculations suggest that it's literally billions or tens of billions of dollars in existing C software, and no one is really champing at the bit to do that again. Um, there, I don't I don't mean to be dismissive of memory safe languages. Uh, I am actually a Haskell person in addition to being a systems person. Um, but uh, I think that we will see going forward that they have like they have probably an expanding niche, but it's I think it's not realistic to to expect that we can like stop and transition all at once. Um, you know, if it turns out that Cherry is just a transition mechanism for the next 20 years, I think that's still a worthwhile thing to have built. Um, I suspect that it will have, however, a, like an enduring uh, outcome. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. It's an excellent question. Anything else? OK, so let's start looking at what Cherry actually is. So uh, it's a capability system. So for people who don't know, naming things is terrible and hard. So I apologize for some of the names. but. Uh, capabilities, as, as used here, um, are communicable, unforgeable tokens that convey authority. And a capability system is just a, a design that uses capabilities as the mechanism for arbitrating access to resources, whatever that might mean. The intent is that because you can only act with the capabilities that you explicitly have, malicious or misbehaving software is in some sense confined to just being able to do, you know, maybe bad things, but only bad things to the resources that it already had con had access to. Uh, there are two sort of central design principles that come along with capability systems. Uh, one is very well known, the principle of least authority or least privilege, uh, which is to say, please try to build software in a way that it has access only to the things that it needs to have access to. Don't let it you know, run with the full authority of the system if it's not going to use it. Uh, and then the other one is the principle of intentional use, which is if you have multiple rights that might, or like multiple capabilities that might give you access to a particular resource, use the correct one. Like you have to explicitly state which one it is that you're using. Uh, this helps cut down on uh, what are called confused deputy attacks for people who know what that means. So Cherry in particular is a capability system that uses capabilities to mediate access to memory. And it basically pries apart uh, the notion of virtualization as done with a, a memory management unit, which protects locations in memory uh, from protection, which uh, track is much more a property of the references, right? You have an object, you have a read-only pointer to an object, um, as opposed to having a read-only object. A memory capability authorizes access to a range of virtual addresses. Uh, and the salient point is that Cherry CPUs require a capability whenever you whenever the instruction stream wants to access memory. So even the instruction stream itself, in order to load the next instruction, you have, a, have, you have to have a capability to that region of memory. And if you want to load or store data, you have to have a capability to the region that you're trying to access. Abstractly, this gives rise to a kind of graph view of the world. And indeed, when you're reasoning about capability systems in general, and Cherry in particular, there's a lot of induction and transitive closure in the kinds of reasoning that you do. Memory capabilities in Cherry feel a lot like pointers. So if I'm given a capability to say all of the user address space in a, in a CPU or in a, pro, in a computer, um, I can derive capabilities to the heap or to individual allocations within the heap uh, or to particular the data section of the executable or particular globals within it, and then the stack and indeed particular allocations on the stack. 
there are some really nice properties that capabilities give us, so architecturally. So there's a notion of integrity and provenance to them. That is to say, capabilities come only from other capabilities and only via permitted actions. So if you receive a bunch of bytes over the network, none of those bytes represent a capability. They are just data. Uh, you, right, you can't transmit these things except to have a capability and derive another one from it. There are bounds, as I said, on these capabilities. So they using one, you cannot access an adjacent object. Um, and minimizing bounds is, of course, not something that the architecture can do by itself, but it is something that software, the software stack can do it throughout. So the linker will arrange that your globals are bounded to just the one global. Um, all of the stuff emitted by the compiler as part of managing the stack. Malloc will bound its allocations. And these things can be repeatedly reduced. So once you have set the bounds to something, you can again carve out a piece, a smaller piece of it. So there's a notion of sub objects available. All of these actions are monotonic. So having restricted the bounds of a capability, you cannot then grow them back. Um, so this prevents escalation of privilege. And dually, if there are permissions, where right, you can reduce, you can eliminate permissions, but you cannot add them back. Um, Speaking of, right, permissions uh, within each capability, let us say this is a read-write capability, this is a read-execute capability, we can, we can discriminate the intended use of these things, um, and you cannot turn a read-execute capability into a read-write capability. Can you compose capabilities, like if you have capabilities for contiguous regions, you sort of blob uh, them together into one? No, indeed, and we depend on, on not being able to do that. Um, for some, some properties of our stack. So for example, um, not to say that there aren't reasons to, to want it, but um, it would be a little weird, for example, if you just happen to get two results from malloc that were next to each other, and you could then turn them into one object. Right? The intent is that malloc put those bounds on those things for a reason, and you shouldn't be allowed to undo that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, in general, right, having cleaved these things down, um, you might be able, like, if you were the one who did the restriction, you could, of course, go back to the, the thing that you used as the input to that, right? You could get the bigger thing back. Um, or if you, if you still have it, you can use it. But you can't take two adjacent capabilities in general and glue them together. So within a capability, um, for a 64-bit architecture, because those are the most common that we think about, um, a capability is actually a 129-bit structure. Don't worry, I know that sounds like a really weird number. Um, it's So there is a one-bit out-of-band tag that is used to differentiate unstructured data from capabilities. These tags come along for the ride, and they exist in registers and in caches, and out in memory, they're somewhere unseen. They're not, there's not like an architectural bitmap that you can, can directly manipulate um, from software. Uh, if you attempt to store data anywhere within the 128 bits that is a, a capability structure, the tag gets cleared. This, uh, and uh, this means that, the, again, the only way to have a capability is to have started with one and to use a capability preserving operation if you attempt to just twiddle the bits, it'll become data. Um, and anything that attempts to use data when it expects a capability will see that this tag is cleared and will raise an exception. So if you attempt to use a, a clear tag capability to authorize an instruction fetch or a jump or a load, um, then we'll take a CPU trap. Within the capability, there is um, there's this, the 64-bit virtual address, and then there are bounds that use a interesting floating point representation uh, to describe the region around that address that you're allowed to access. Um, curiously, C programmers almost never obey the restriction that pointers are only valid within an object. They frequently, or, or you know, one past its end, they frequently go a little bit out of bounds in either side, and so the the compression and bound scheme that Cherry has actually allows for that. Um, we found it essentially essentially requisite for compiling C programs. 
And then there's a permissions field, which again is how we limit the use of these things. Um, there are both architecturally understood permission bits and uh, software bits. And there's an object type, which we can, which we use for sealing capabilities. I'll talk about that in a moment. So I said that Cherry was an architectural mix-in. Um, so if we think about a non-Cherry CPU, there's a general purpose register file and there's some physical memory. And so Cherry will augment the register file. It will turn the 64-bit integer registers into 129-bit registers so that each register can store a capability. Um, the integer operations will continue to operate on these registers. They just operate on the address part of the capability, and they will clear the tag. There are, second, there are other instructions that manipulate these things as capabilities. We extend the program counter and some of the control words uh, in the machine to also be capabilities. And we introduce this notion of a default data capability, which we use to justify any integer-based load or store. So this is our sort of primary compatibility sandboxing mechanism, where we can take existing integer-based programs and say, all of the integers that you mean are relative to this capability. And then in memory, we augment uh, every pair of 64-bit of words with a tag that we use to preserve the distinction between capabilities and data out once, uh, once they leave the core. And then there's some other miscellaneous extensions throughout. But by and large, this is what it takes to make, uh, to make a CPU cherry aware. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, just in terms of the, the architectural primitive, is that we have this notion of sealed capabilities. So a sealed capability can't be used. You can hold it, but you can't use it until it's unsealed. Um, seals come in multiple types. And you have to have the appropriate type of, uh, when you attempt to unseal. So if you've sealed something with the white label and you have the white key, you can get it back. But if you try to use the black key to unlock a white object, it doesn't work. Um, the intended uses for these are things like runtime type information checks uh, and also for intercompartment references. So I can have a, piece, have a pointer to a chunk of my memory, seal that pointer, to a type that I control, hand it to you, you can do whatever you want with that pointer except use it, but eventually you can hand it back to me and I can unseal it and go access that memory again. Uh, there's an architectural mechanism called C invoke where you can take a pair of sealed capabilities and make a method call basically uh, that will install one of these capabilities as the program counter and one of them as a, a data pointer that's available to the target. And there are some, some just to say, there are some, some like specialized versions of that also available uh, as architectural primitives. OK, questions on the basic architecture before we dive into like what C does? Hearing nothing. So when we compile C down to Cherry, uh, we use Cherry capabilities for both all of the language level pointers that are visible in the source program. So you know, function pointers, pointers to heap objects, so on, and implementation pointers that are implicit in the program. So these are things like return addresses, entries in the global offset table, var args, so on. So the compiler will generate code to build these, uh, these var arg arrays from the stack capability to bound address taken stack allocations. The loader will do a bunch of work to ensure that capabilities to globals and to, to PLT stubs and entry tables and so on are derived, are, are bounded. These are derived from the kernel provided routes. The kernel says, I have loaded you. Here is a capability to the thing that I have loaded. The loader then goes and refines these down before giving them to the C program. There are some small changes to C semantics that we've had to do along the way. So for example, mem move has to be tag preserving. Um, pointers now have single provenance, whereas C sort of is fuzzy on what that means. Um, and integer pointer casts are a little exciting, but we have what we think is an answer for it. Um, if you're curious, we have this document, the C, C++ programming guide, uh, which 
sheds a lot of light on what we've done. It's not enough, though, to be able to compile C to Cherry. We actually have to have a runtime environment for it. So there's a paper from uh, 2019 called Cherry ABI, uh, and it's basically how do we construct the whole Unix runtime for a C program um, on top of Cherry. So capabilities replace integer pointers basically throughout the whole thing, and we delete our compatibility capability. We say, you know, you're only using capabilities to talk to, to memory. Um, again, the kernel linker memory allocator and compiler all sort of conspire to manage these things. Um, the biggest change is that the kernel will now require that the user program present a capability when it passes a reference up to the kernel. So you can't, whereas before you would say pass read a pointer, right, just a 64 bit address saying, please, dear kernel, write data here. Um, the kernel will now require that you pass it a capability demonstrating that you have access to that buffer. In terms of performance, uh, as of ASPLUS 2019, these numbers are a little stale, um, we see that there's about you know, somewhere between 0 to 10% cycle overhead most of the time. Um, and as you might expect from doubling the size of pointers, we see that there is increased pressure on the L2 cache. Um, these numbers are not like please don't take these with with you know as as ground truth these are just a particular point in time there are caveats to these in both directions um morella will give us a much better understanding of the overheads the actual overheads involved but we think we think you know single digit percents uh probably the right target and attainable questions on anything there Okay, so I'll dive ahead in then into to what I work on. So one of the challenges, just broadly speaking, one of the challenges in a capability system is revocation. So if Alice has a capability to some shared document and grants a copy of that capability to Carol, who then grants a, cop a, a copy, possibly with reduced permissions, to Bob, Anyone who has done one of these grants might want to ungrant it, right? Either they didn't mean it, or you know, some something has gone wrong. Bob has left the company, right? There's some reason to want to to revoke these permissions. So this is, in some sense, the hard problem of a capability system, especially when not just so Carol could, for example, revoke access to Bob, but Carol retains access. So there's this notion of of just undoing particular grants in the provenance tree. But it has to be transitive too. If Alice ungrants from Carol, then Carol never had the authority to grant it to Bob in the first place. So this generally requires a whole bunch of additional metadata tracking, look aside tables, all kinds of things that, interestingly, Cherry doesn't have. So why do I bring this up? Well, Malik and Free is an interesting special case of this. So as the application allocates heap objects, it will effectively delegate access or, or store those pointers all over the place. It will store them in the heap, on the stack, in global variables, in registers. It will even pass them to the kernel. When the application frees an object, it might inadvertently, perhaps maliciously, retain references to that free memory. And if the allocator just comes along and constructs a new overlapping object, well, then now there's a temporal alias to that piece of memory. So instead, we actually want to globally revoke access to freed memory and only then construct the new object. So we want to be able to do this kind of global revocation where the allocator can claw back all of the pointers it has ever given out to a piece of memory and then safely reissue that, knowing that there can't be any aliasing. So Cherry does not have the requisite look aside tables for most implementations of revocation. So it, we're basically uh, required to go scan memory to find where these capabilities live. But there are some nice things that Cherry does for us all the same. 
So we have these explicit tags that are architecturally visible, so we can precisely identify capabilities in memory. There's no guesswork. Is this a pointer versus an integer? It's just, is its tag set? Yes, it's a pointer. Um, this is by contrast to things like the BoMGC or Marcus, which have to have some additional metadata and effort invested in, is this thing that I just loaded a pointer? By virtue of requiring capabilities to access memory, Cherry ensures that all architectural pointers are visible, not just those available to the abstract machine. So that is to say, arbitrary code execution is not really a special threat. Cherry is already prepared to deal with arbitrary code, and so we can come along for the ride. And having uh, Having cherified a heap allocator, it's, the heap allocators are already spatially bounding their return capabilities. So when you ask malloc for a chunk of 1024 bytes, you get access only to those 1024 bytes. And because cherry capabilities are monotonic, this means that any derived capability from that original grant has its bounds as a subset of that original grant. So we can always look at a pointer and unambiguously find which allocation did this come from? Even if you have taken the pointer out of bounds and you know, have done weird things with it, we can always identify which allocation it came from. So the story now, uh, in we the first effort along this was a, a simulation or feasibility study called Cherryvoke, where, as before, the application allocates heap objects, frees them. When when we free an object, we don't actually immediately make the memory available for reuse. We mark the space as quarantined and describe the quarantine in a shadow bitmap. So we just go and set a bunch of bits to say, these parts of memory are free, they are in quarantine. Eventually, we ask the kernel, in fact, to go do a global sweep of, of all process memory and delete all of the pointers whose or all of the capabilities that point into quarantine. It's a very simple test, right? You find a pointer in the address space, you say, does this point to somewhere that has a bit set in the shadow? And if yes, right, you delete it. And having done that, it's now safe to reissue memory, right? We know that there are no aliases to that the allocator can grant it. So the revoker itself, lives in the kernel and has sort of three different aspects. The first is there's specialized code for managing the kernel managed state. So things like thread register files or explicitly held capabilities, um, those just need special things to check, right? The architecture is not going to do it for us. The bulk of the revoker is this sweep through memory. Uh, it looks like a bunch of nested for loops um, for each object, each memory object that's mapped in the, the address space, uh, for each page in that object, for each cache line in that page, for each capability in that line, does it point into quarantine? And if the answer is yes, we need to revoke that capability. And it's, there are some options as to what we do. We can clear the tag. We could leave the tag but zero out the permissions. Maybe we actually just completely write zeros to write null. You can imagine this being application configurable. The point is there's still there's some wiggle room in what exactly it means to revoke a capability. There are many ways of expressing no permission. On top of this, we actually added some architectural assists. So for uh, when we're looking at a cache line, we can load just the tags without the data. So we can basically stream through tag memory without needing to actually haul data in from DRAM. Uh, and then we also added a notion of capability dirty tracking, which will let us skip pages that we know don't contain any capabilities. So uh, those do a pretty good job at getting us just to the capabilities in the in the system. We don't actually page through all of application memory. And then the last bit of the revoker is a front end state machine that drives a two phase revocation. So right, the simplest thing to do would be to just stop the world, walk all of memory, and resume the world. Um, this works. It's not particularly pleasant. So we tried to have a more concurrent story. So the first thing we do is we're going to actually sweep all of the pages in the application, and we're going to mark them as having been swept. Right? They're, they're clean. Um, 
by the time and we will rely on the capability dirty tracking machinery to re-dirty them as stores happen or as stores target clean pages. Then having done that, having done hopefully the bulk of the work, we will then stop the world and just sweep the dirty pages. And there are only hopefully a few of those. So we did all of that and we measured how well we did. Um, and we found that there are actually pretty low aggregate cycle overheads. So we're the two bars on the left uh, and the other ones are some competitors. Um, and we have about like le less than about 9% uh, throughput overhead um, with this. So that's the good news. We're, we're pretty good with 10% you know, CPU overhead, 33% memory overhead. The bad news is that that concurrent design didn't actually work out as well as we would hope. Um, applications are busy flinging capabilities everywhere. And so even as you are, you know, as you are t just taking the time to scan every page once, they will have dirtied about 10% of their pages. Uh, and so when you go to stop the world, it turns out that you will still stop for more than two seconds uh, on the FPGA prototype. Admittedly, it's only running at 50 megahertz, so, but still, that's an uncomfortably long pause time. So the key takeaway from, from this paper uh, was that the possibility um, of the, the application being able to store a capability that you might not have checked for revocation yet means that when it does a store, you have to go look at the whole page. Probably that capability was actually fine. It's not too freed memory because applications don't frequently manipulate capabilities to freed memory. So we thought for a while about how we could fix this. And the, the question was, can we make sure that the application only ever has access to capabilities that aren't scheduled to be revoked so that as it goes and stores them everywhere, um, it's not increasing the amount of work that we have to do because we know that we have already checked those. So, yeah, where I said that. Um, so we stole another idea from the, the garbage collection community, uh, one, a notion of load barriers. So in systems with garbage collectors, uh, especially concurrent garbage collectors, it's especially frequent to want to catch loads of pointers from the heap. So we unfortunately, and like they do this frequently by instrumenting the code as they're generating it. You know, it's two or three instructions that they do every time they load from memory. We can't do that because we're, we're an architectural mechanism, uh, but we, so we need to bake something into to the CPU. And what we did was basically, or what we settled on was, what if we could trap on a capability load from a page if the page hasn't yet been checked? And ideally, we would like to be able to indicate that all pages haven't been checked in constant time rather than having to go and mark each one of them only to then mark them again. So the way we've done this uh, is to introduce a capability load generation flag. Uh, so it's a single bit per CPU core and per PTE. And if, you, if the software performs a capability load, if those two bits match, the load is permitted, and if they mismatch, the load raises a trap. Having caught the trap, the revoker can go and do its thing and set the bit. So what does that story look like? The steady state, the most common one when you are not engaged in revocation, is that all of these bits are equal. At the very beginning of revocation, all we really have to do is toggle the, the bit on the core, and now every page will trigger a trap. We catch all of those traps as they happen, and we then update the PTE's bit after we've done the check, authorizing that page or everything on that page to be loaded by the application. And in the background, we want to sweep all of the pages, right? In addition to the one that the application is just landing on, we sweep all of the pages. This restores the steady state condition that all of these bits are now equal. Every page has been checked. All revocation is done. We can set the, we can let the application go again. So this gives rise to a, a revised two-phase design. We do a very small barrier at the beginning. And then concurrently, as I said, we take these traps and we visit all the pages in the background. 
And what we have found with very preliminary benchmarking uh, is that it looks like we're about 10% faster than the cornucopia work from before. Uh, but more importantly, well, that, that's, that's great unto itself, but more importantly, the barrier phases are about six milliseconds on the prototype FPGA, uh, and the per page trap times are hundreds of microseconds. So this is, this is fantastic, right? The maximum pause time that the application will experience is this very occasional rare barrier, and there will be a bunch of little interruptions, but very, very small. We expect broadly similar results on real CPUs like Morello, and all of the architectural mechanism for doing this is already available in Morello. Uh, they were nice enough to add it for us. So, uh, Cherry in a nutshell, so it's a capability-based architectural extension for existing ISAs intended to be usable by C and C++ compilers, distinguishes addresses from pointers, requires that capabilities, impl the implementation of pointers, have sound architectural provenance and requires monotonic actions and has these very controlled mechanisms for doing non-monotonic moves, turns many would-be vulnerabilities into crashes, and it can be used by software to limit the damage from an exploited vulnerability. It also turns out to be a surprisingly effective substrate for heap temporal safety. Uh, we can robustly identify pointers and allocations using tags and monotonicity, and the memory sweep can be accelerated by even modest architectural changes. So if you're just champing at the bit to play with this, uh, go grab Cherry Build, our one-stop shop build system. It can download and run everything, including all of the Morello bits. Um, and we've got, we put together a series of little demonstrations and exercises for training red teams uh, on Cherry. Uh, and if you're if you're curious, please do get in touch. I've, I'll leave. Uh, I'll send the slides out, and uh, there are some suggested uh, readings for the curious. Uh, and with that, I think I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions. Fun. Yeah, hi, very nice talk. Um, in the beginning, I said to you, you said uh, that uh, there is work on Python, and especially since you made the connection to the garbage collection world, I was wondering what the story is around um, kind of garbage collected languages in Cherry and um, how, how these mechanisms essentially interact and whether they're performance uh, or security issues concerned yes. with these languages. An excellent question uh, to which I do not have an excellent answer. Um, so there was a couple of years ago, 2017, I think, um, there's a paper called Cherry JNI um, pushing the Java security model into the sea, um, where we, actually, we, it was before my time, the, the computer lab augmented a JVM so that the um, all of the pointers that went out to the, the native code um, were sealed capabilities or, well, usually sealed, but were capabilities. Um, and so the native code was essentially forced to play by the, the VM's object model rules. Um, and this included the garbage collector's actions. Um, but that's about as close as I know. Um, just recently, the Qt WebKit uh, JavaScript engine has been cherified on Morello and is actually emitting cherry aware instructions. Um, it's not running in compatibility mode. Uh, so I think that we haven't yet done a huge amount of work um, in like taking advantage of cherry from a, a garbage collector or VM perspective. Um, but I think that that, that work is, uh, you know, is becoming possible. Um, so I hope that we will soon have a better answer. OK, cool. Thank you. Yeah, Dominic. Uh, I had a, a very low level and then perhaps a, a very high level question. So the, the very low level question is just about some sort of nuts and bolts of doing kind of C programming with Cherry. So. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to 
do point to arithmetic um, in my code. Um, I assume that's still allowed, but there's yeah. some kind of like the the range of the capability tells me what I'm, you know, what how much pointer arithmetic I'm allowed to do or something like this. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So uh, how how to answer this question? So so if you have a pointer type uh, in C and you do integer arithmetic on it, the compiler understands not to use the existing integer instructions, but to use the capability address manipulation instructions. So there is there's specifically, for example, a increment offset better should better be known as increment address instruction that says in this capability, please adjust the address by this, you know, by this integer amount. Right. Um, that interacts like for small increments that does the right thing. It, more broadly, it has to interact with the compression scheme. So you're allowed to do pointer arithmetic always within bounds and a little bit out of bounds. Um, your um, the compression scheme guarantees that you the region you can represent is t at least twice the size of the the actual object um, with I think a quarter below and three quarters above. Um, so you can go a little bit below the beginning and a little and a little bit further after the end. Um, but in fact, that turns out to be more or less sufficient. Um, there are occasionally places in C where you have like, eh, OK, you're doing some weird stuff. Um, uh, yeah, but couldn't, guess, that, couldn't that permission, that permissiveness in terms of going slightly over, couldn't that still uh, lead to some buffer overflows? Sorry, so 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 there's a we, we draw a distinction between representability and authority. You're only allowed to access within the actual bounds. But oh, right. represent pointers out of bounds. And if you so the problem, like the way the compression scheme works is basically we say the bounds and the address have common bits up top, um, right? They only differ. So there's basically a sliding you know, a, a, a sliding window of where the bits differ. And if you make too large of a change, you would cause us to reinterpret the bounds as being somewhere else in memory. And so what we do at that point, if you would, if you tried to force us to do that, we would clear the tag and say, no, we cannot even represent that anymore um, because it would get interpreted differently. Um, but shy of that, we can let you wander out of bounds and still precisely constrain your authority to the bounds. I see. Yeah. Okay. That makes that makes more sense. Then. Great. Um, I'll save my other question and let Simon uh, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Uh, I was wondering how the interaction between these bits for marking uh, dirty regions of memory with respect to you know, fresh capabilities interact mm. in the context of a real-time operating system. Is that the sort of thing that that where the performance hit makes it unacceptable if you're implementing an RTOS on Cherry, or is it small enough that in reality it will all be fine? Uh, what a good question. I don't think we know. Um, I so. It is true that we depend on taking traps for some of that dirty tracking, right? If, if we've actually got the page completely clean, we know that it doesn't have any capabilities on it. Um, the first capability store, we, we will, we, well, we've arranged the architecture to trap so that we can go and set some metadata to say, this is a page we need to start paying attention to. Um, otherwise, we like, there we'll, we'll, the architecture will do some maintenance of dirty and clean bits for us, um, but we won't be trapping. Um, this is this is an, an this is used just to accelerate the sweep on big systems. If you had a small system where you and you know the kind of thing you were more likely to put an RTOS on, um, you could just not do that. You could just say we have to investigate every page. Um, or you could uh, you could probably come up with some slightly different mechanism where it didn't trap, but it set bits and you you interlocked against the the main program um, at a finer granularity. Um, but more broadly, uh, Cherry grew up, as it were, around Unix and like Unix style designs. Um, there hasn't been a lot, and so and so it tends to trap quite often. Um, there hasn't been a lot of work in like a real-time cherry, but I think that there would certainly be interest in it. 
just from a, a follow-on question, if mm -hmm. one, to investigate real-time Cherry, can the features that cause this frequent trapping be disabled in the Morello hardware? So or actually, the, uh, so Morello is, is how do I put it? Morello is a little different um, because ARM is adverse to trapping. Um, they, they they especially don't want to trap in any data dependent way. So uh, a lot of the the work in going from the MIPS and RISC-V description of Cherry to the Morello version was, you know, where where the earlier ones would have said trap if. Um, Morello frequently says clear the tag if. Um, so there's been some work along that. And like most of the traps are now relegated to um, to truly exceptional cases. Like you you are attempting to do something without a tag or you um, you are loading from a page that has that doesn't have the right permissions. Um, but I think that there's, uh, I don't know to what extent those are configurable in Morello. I suspect that most of it is baked in, but uh, I, I confess I don't know. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, you have your hand up. Teams is very slow. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Wes. Very nice talk. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I had three questions, but I'm going to ask only one of them right now. Which one do I want to ask? Uh, it's the one that you, your your penultimate slide, I think, says something tantalizing about controlled non monotonicity. So I'm yeah. often dealing with C code that is not actually monotonic, and I wondered to what extent that's a problem for you, and what what the the the, the tools you have in the box to to deal with it are. Yeah. yeah. So um, Cherry yeah. continues to have non monotonic actions on ring transitions, like for architectures that are ring based, which is all of the ones we've tested doing anything with so far. Um, there are capability registers that are you know, inaccessible to user mode code that become accessible when you're in the kernel. Um, so you can, if you take a domain transition in, in the, like the ring sense, you gain some capabilities that's non-monotonic. Um, but the other, the mechanisms that we have more explored for intra-ring non-monotonicity um, are these sealed capabilities. So, uh, this is this is, I think, still a very active area of exploration. There's a bunch of ideas, and we don't quite know how they will all be useful or if indeed they're all useful. Um, but in general, the you either mediate non-monotonicity with another capability. So you have a sealed capability and the rights to unseal things of that type, um, in which case it's not in some sense, it's not really non-monotonic, like you always could have put those two things together. Um, or you seed control of the machine. Um, so you, by, by gaining some non by doing something that's non-monotonic, you are forced to give up control flow. So you always land on some code that expects to have elevated privileges, right? or at least relative to what it was. Um, and the hope is, we, there, and there's some there's some work along these lines, but the hope is that you can take just that little primitive and build a you know mutually distrusting uh, set of of processes all within the same address space that are using Cherry to confine themselves um, and and defend against each other. Um, Exactly what the ultimate shape of that will be, I think, is still open. Um, there have been some proposals that look like, well, just directly jump to like from one from one compartment to another, um, and there have been others that are jump up to a trusted intermediate that then jumps back down. Um, uh, both of those have been explored. I think neither to completion. Okay, because I was guessing that um, with WebKit you would have run into some, you know, if you've got a bunch of C++ code with a load of downcasts, then you've kind of got this problem already. And ah, so there is, yeah, um, that kind of non-monotonicity. So um, one of the things that we've run across, for example, is if you try to, so imagine you've got a composite structure with an intrusive linked list. Um, if you take the address of the intrusive linked list structure um, and you try to bound just to that, then your linked list code will work just fine. But when you try to jump back out to having the whole object, suddenly you're out of bounds. Um, and so what we've had to do in practice for that is say, 
No, no, the type of the intrusive list node is one that doesn't have restricted bounds applied to it. So when you take that address, please, please change the address, but leave the bounds to be the whole structure. Um, there's probably another design that I don't think we've done, but could, that is instead seal the capability to the whole structure into the intrusive linked list and then grant the linked list code the ability to unseal that. Um, and you could, you know, it, depending on what your threat model is, if you believe the C abstract machine, right, that suffices to put the unsealing right in a static global within the linked list code and, and you're done. Um, if you're more worried about ad, like arbitrary code, which could follow pointers to get to that, um, then you have to do at least a little bit of a compartment switch in and like scrub the registers on the way back out when you do that so that you don't leak the unsealing right. Um, but I think this is also a, a really interesting area that hasn't, you know, it's had some attention, but maybe not enough. Yeah, I don't know. So, Stephen, do you want to leave Dominic ask the next question, or <laughs> you want to ask one, another one? Oops, uh, you turned your microphone off, Stephen. <laughs> it takes about two seconds to unmute on the new version of Teams, which is great. Um, uh, yeah, Dom, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, so I was wondering whether there's uh, whether it would be possible to exploit knowledge from a compiler about, um, let's say you had some sort of language with some degree of memory safety mm -hmm. or, I don't know, like borrowing or things like that. Um, could you exploit that information when compiling um, so that you don't have to do as much sort of like memory sweep stuff that you were discussing? Or is it like we just have to, we just always have to do this kind of thing? We can't sort so, of compile. Yeah use this compiler in some ways? Um, no, it, it's an interesting question, and it depends a little bit on what your threat model is. Yeah. Um, so but if you are running, say, completely safe Rust code, then when you deallocate something, like you know that was, that was it, right? You've got a checked proof that that was the one, right? Don't bother quarantining it. Just go put it back in the prequel. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. So I think like, these kinds of things are totally legitimate. Um, but it gets a little funny when you start saying, like, when you start looking at some of those those preconditions, right? You know, there was the unsafe keyword. Hmm, what do I like? How much do I think that's like that's unsafe, right? Or you know, this is an FFI call. This pointer may have escaped out to C and may be retained. Um, so probably there's room for for escape analysis kinds of things where you can say, yeah, you're right. Like I I truly believe that this thing is is ready for prompt reuse, go for it. Um, whereas, you know, this one I'm not so sure about. Um, and you might even want to do like more than just at the free site. Um, you might even want to propagate that information back up to the allocation site and maintain separate heaps. Um, because being able to, so one of the things I didn't say in, in the work on temporal safety, um, What's actually being quarantined is not the physical memory, it's the virtual address space. And so one of the ways that you can reduce your memory overhead for this quarantining game is if an entire page becomes free, you can just release the backing memory while the addresses are still in quarantine. So if you had, um, if you had arranged your program so that anything that might need revocation actually ends up on this much bigger heap or sorry, this, this separate heap that and is like more or less contiguous, um, then just release those pages as you go. And like, yeah, eventually you'll run out of your, you know, 39-bit address space or whatever, um, and you'll have to go do one of these memory sweeps. But you'll only be sweeping the live memory, and you'll be reclaiming this huge track of virtual address space. So it will be a very rare event. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I again just to, to hammer it home. I think that there's really interesting opportunity in the like machine checked language and cherry intersection, and we just we haven't been in a position to do it. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Evening, yes. Some more questions. Yeah, still on the topic of revocation now. I, mm. I, I, I think I need to go and read the papers, but um, I, I guess with quarantining, the, there's an observation which is that revocation doesn't have to be synchronous, right? It's OK yeah, to yeah. take time. Uh, and then when you when you had the big pause times, was that just because your assumption about there being not many dirty pages turned out to be wrong? Yes, yeah. basically. OK, OK. Uh, Oh, and my other question was because um, I've often thought about doing a quarantining malloc, but not in a cherry context. So my question is, is your code uh, so terrified that that would be a waste of time for me to try and de cherryfy it? Um, no, I, actually. So so we, we for a cornucopia, we actually went and instrumented a couple of allocators and we also have like a generic wrapper. Um, that does, you know, so from in the wrapper case, but right, the allocator is just believes that quarantine is still allocated. Um, I, the first of those anyway, and maybe the second as well, but certainly the first of those allocators was done on x86 just so we could get some, like, suppose we had, you know, the, this really fancy vector architecture that we could use to do sweeping, um, just kind of performance numbers. And, and it was doing all of the quarantining logic. Um, it's DL Malik, so it's nothing to really write home about, but it's there to play with. Awesome. That could be very useful in when I hypothetically get around to working on this again. Um, yeah. Um, hopefully in the near future, I should find some wood to knock on. Um, Microsoft's SN Malik will also be uh, quarantine capable and should that should be relatively orthogonal to the charification bits. Um, awesome. Yeah, any more questions? Everyone stays quiet. Yeah. Well, I think then thank you very much again for your thank talk. You for yeah, yeah. Um, I'll send the slides over for distribution. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, and uh, I see, yeah, I mean, you are happy that I put this video on YouTube or something like that? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, awesome. uh, thank you to everyone. Yeah, and I'm sorry we can't kind of just go to the pub and have a drink or uh, go for dinner. So, uh, sometime in the future that might come again then. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, Wes. Thanks Take very care. much. Hope to see you soon. Indeed.